Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. It's an honor and pleasure to have Rabbi Dr. Natan Slifkin on the podcast. It's a long time coming. We are big fans. And before we begin on the topic, which is your book, Rationalism versus Mysticism, we want the audience who maybe don't know you to know a little bit about you. Uh, if you could tell us about yourself a little bit. Sure. Firstly, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, there's uh, basically two aspects to my work. Some people know me better for one, some people for the other. Uh, by day, I uh, am the director of the Biblical Museum of Natural History near Bet Shemesh, a museum all about the animal world of the Torah, featuring a combination of live and taxidermy exhibits. And I've also written some books on that topic, such as the Torah Encyclopedia of the Animal Kingdom. But by night, um, I'm also known as the, uh, in some circles, as a controversial figure uh, for my writings about uh, conflicts between Torah and science uh, leading to rationalism versus mysticism, and my and my blog, rationalistjudaism.com. Fascinating. Fantastic. And um, the, your book, The Challenge of Creation, your other book, to me, which is very eye-opening and remarkable, um, that I feel like that doesn't get the attention it deserves because it's, you know, it's an old book by now. But um, maybe you could also tell us about your experience with that, you know, coming out with a book on evolution. Right. Uh, how, that, how that affected you and how that, um, you know, what that experience was like. Right. So I was always fascinated by um, the natural world, you know, especially the animal kingdom. So when I started uh, Yeshiva many, many years ago, so I was interested in, in topics that came up relating to that. So I was interested in dinosaurs and how we reconcile that. I was interested in the zoological phenomenon mentioned in the Gemara and things that, that don't seem to be scientifically true and what to, how to make sense of those. And gradually I was fortunate enough uh, to meet some people of Aria Carmel and others who guided me in approach and uh, approaches which I found very helpful and which I wanted to share with others. So I wrote some books on these topics, which, uh, as you know, were spec were considered to be uh, very slightly controversial or absolutely heretical um, by two or three or three dozen or so uh, leading rabbinic authorities in the Haredi world. So that led to the uh, very um, prominent and controversial ban on my books. Uh, in 2004, 2005, where, you know, three dozen rabbinic authorities uh, attested that my books are, are, are heretical. And actually, I prefer to, I like to refer to the ban as controversial rather than my books, because the truth is my books had already been out for a few years by that point, uh, without any fuss. Uh, but when they were banned, now that was controversial. <laughs> That's when a lot of people got very upset. Right. And, uh, you know, I have read... Um that book and many other books. And like you say, um, there's your, your style has always been a style of sticking to the Mephoshim, sticking to, you know, Rishonim, sticking to, you know, what, what, uh, what our great leaders and rabbis of the past have always, you know, have always uh, put out. Put out. Um, and to, and for them to ban the book, in my eyes, after I've re read, reading the books, there's almost not even that much of your opinion in any of them. It's really just, and this is actually, we're going to, it's yeah. kind of a segue into the book itself that we want to talk about today. Um, the book that we're we're going to talk about today, Rationalism versus Mysticism, is that, your, I believe that's your latest book, correct? Yeah, and that's a book that really emerges, I mean, the research for that book emerges out of, out of me trying to understand the ban in my books. In other words, when the, when the ban happened, it was very hard to understand. You know, how could it be that ideas which, uh, for myself, for my own rabbinim, for the people, you know, my community, the things in my books were, A, true, uh, and B, not even especially controversial yes. uh, or radical. Uh, and yet those very same ideas were to a whole other group of people, you know, so, uh, false and, and nonsense and absolutely heretical. You know, how could there be such a gulf? So uh, a lot of the work I did for my uh, for my master's and for my doctorate was trying to uh, to understand that, and that's when I really uh, understood that really you know beneath the issues of Torah and science, it was a difference in a whole underlying worldview between the rationalist and the mystical perspective. And once I discovered that, that I, I began to see so many other applications of that difference, and that's how this book emerged. That is so fascinating. 
Awesome. Okay, so let's get right into it. And uh, let's start with um, a very fascinating chapter, the chapter of the sages versus science, the sun's path at night, which is a lengthy chapter. So we don't expect you to, you know, go through right. all of it. But if you can give us a synopsis of that chapter. Right. So that was an interesting topic in that if there was one big mistake I made in the whole controversy of the over my books, it was not realizing how crucial this one topic was to it and, uh, and, and kind of forcing people to address it. Because uh, you know, with, the, with, the, with my position that I quoted in the books, that as great as Chazal, the sages were in their knowledge of Torah, but when it comes to science, they just you know, knew whatever other people knew back then, which was sometimes mistaken. So I kind of presented that as you know, the, the view of just a few a small number of authorities who said that, you know, explicitly, Rambam, Rambam Asad, Rav Shemson, Rav Hirsch, you know, and, and I presented it as being a legitimate minority view, uh, whereas my opponent slammed it as being an illegitimate minority view. In other words, either they claimed that these authorities never said any such thing, or they said it was, you know, something so aberrant that it's fallen, you know, beyond the, uh, the purview of what's acceptable in Jewish thought today, because it's just a, one of these weird, aberrant views. But with the sun's path at night, what I discovered is that how normative this view is. And the discussion really centers around a discussion in the Gemara about where does the sun go at night? And the Gemara presents a dispute between the sages of Israel and the non-Jewish astronomers, where the non-Jewish astronomers say that at night the sun goes on around the other side of the world, which is true. Whereas the Jewish astronomers say that at night, the sun circles back and goes above the sky, that the sky is an opaque dome. And at night, the sun goes uh, circles up behind the sky, which may sound very strange to us, but that was absolutely normative in Babylonian cosmology. Yeah. And the Gemara continues to say that Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi uh, uh, realizes that the non-Jewish astronomers are the ones who are correct. And he concedes that, which is also very significant. And now, the, the standard view you'll hear, when people usually try to avoid talking about the Gemara, when they do talk about it, they say, oh, the Gemara is not really speaking about where the sun goes at night. It's really talking about, you know, some deeper metaphysical phenomena. Yeah. Um, but when I looked into it thoroughly, what I found was that among the Rishonim, right, among the great medieval rabbinic authorities, so every single one, without exception, understood that this was a discussion about astronomy. Yeah. Nobody ever, nobody said it was talking about some deeper metaphysical thing. Nobody at all. Uh, there was one of those showed him, Rabbeinu Tam, he said that, that, the, that the, actually the Jewish ast astronomers, right, the Chazal, were actually correct. Uh, he believed that they actually couldn't prove their case, but the sun really does go behind the sky at night because he still subscribed to the Babylonian cosmology. Um, but everyone agreed they were talking about astronomy. <laughs> there was no, there was no difference, dispute about that. And whereas in the uh, beginning of the 16th century, you started to have a few authorities who were very uncomfortable. And I think the reason why they got very uncomfortable is that the 16th century was a time where there were tremendous advances in astronomy, yeah. right, with uh, Galileo and so on. And here were the uh, sages of the Talmud who were still stuck in the, the Babylonian cosmology. They weren't even up to the Ptolemaic cosmology. So they provide, they started to present different ways of learning the Gemara. Right? They have to, the terms actually mean something different. And then he got to the Maharal, who uh, completely uh, says that the Chazal were never talking about science. They were always talking about you know, uh, metaphysical issues. But still, because the Gemara was so clear and there was such a strong tradition in the Rishonim as how to interpret it. So there are still many prominent Achronim, many prominent rabbinic authorities who interpreted the Gemara at face value. Yes, the sages of the, uh, the Talmud were mistaken about where the sun goes at night. So that really, you know, cuts down to the core of this whole issue about Torah and science, that you have something where the Rishonim were perfectly comfortable with it. Some of the Achronim were uncomfortable, others were not. And But you see it there. You see it clearly there. And so then in the polemic over my book, so some people wanted to say, well, only in that case were they wrong about science uh, <laughs> because the, the Gemara acknowledged it, but, but nowhere else. But you know, that really doesn't make any sense because, you know, if they, were, if they could be mistaken on that, then why can't they be mistaken about more obscure things? 
Uh, and in that case, by the way, uh, they even thought that they were able to bring Torah proofs to their position. All right, that they, uh, Chazal and elsewhere, they brought uh, Sukkim in an attempt to support their position about the sun going behind the sky at night. So if even in that case, they could still be mistaken. And Rabbi Yudah Hanasi was himself was perfectly comfortable saying so. You know, he didn't feel his religious worldview was being threatened by that. And none of the Rishonim felt that their religion was being threatened by that. So it's certainly a legitimate approach to take. Yeah, it's this uh, Das Torah approach today that people have where Everything is Masora, right? Everything, uh, whatever they said is... is right. Or Ruach HaKodesh. Ruch, exactly. Ruch HaKodesh, right. Ruch HaKodesh. So that was another thing. Idea. They say, um, right, Sod Hashem Li Reot. Mm. Right? That was a concept that was thrown around a lot at the time, the controversy of my book. Sod Hashem Li Reot, uh, that, you know, that, 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 that Hazal have a supernatural uh, insight into things. So with, with all these concepts that come up, you have to look into them properly. And that's what I did with that. And, and it's amazing, you know, how many times does Soda Shemilev actually appear in Shas? You know, what, what, what's your guess? You know, people will think it comes up here you know, 20 times, 30 times, 40 times. It appears three times, <laughs> just three times. And even in those three occasions, it's just presented as a speculation uh, that, that one of Chazal says something. And there's a question well, how did he know it? And they present some possibilities. Maybe he was told it, whatever. And one possibility is, you know, maybe, possibly. Uh, he had supernatural insight. But it's, you know, it's only three times as a speculation. Whereas there's many case, cases in the Gemara like this where it's explicit that they, they didn't know something or, or they found something out uh, through empir empirical investigation, a potentially mistaken investigation. So, um, you know, when you start looking into all these concepts from the sources all the way through, you realize that, uh, that this, this mystical approach was not the approach uh, that was traditionally taken. Even by the Rishonim who were not as rational as, let's say, the Ramban. Yeah, correct. even if you go with like you know Ramban, Ramban, and, yes, the absolutely. Camp within the Rishonim, a lot of times what I'm realizing as I go through these chapters in the book is they're all. Hold on a second. More... I think we have a siren here. Oh. No, false alarm. All okay. <laughs> yeah, all okay. Um, so what I've been realizing is even the more mystical camp within the Rishonim, for the most part, the way they go about things um, is, is very rational. Um, even yeah. even sure. you know, even though they have their own, you know, uh, whatever. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's... yeah, yeah. So Ramban, you know, was comfortable. Well, you know, pointed out that the rainbow is uh, appears has been proven to be a scientific phenomenon. Therefore, how do you understand? Uh, what's said about the rainbow after the flood, um, and also the beginning of Parashat Mitzorah, about the process of conception. He says, you know, scientists have proved certain things about this process, and therefore we have to reevaluate our understanding of what the Torah means. Exactly. It's truly amazing that you both you see it in the Talmud, you see it in the Rishonim, of course you see it in the Gonim. They were all so, they, science was always so important to them, and a part of how they view Judaism. It, it, it informed mm -hmm. their views, regardless what their views were. Right. Um, and we've come away from that today. You know, right. something there was a tremendous insecurity. There's reasons why we've come away from that. There is a lot more insecurity today. Uh, and the fact is science does you know, uh, pose more of a challenge to Judaism today than it used to. Yeah. And in the modern world, especially, I would say even more than science, is that, you know, modern society uh, poses a tremendous challenge to Judaism and therefore you know people circle the wagons all right and let's also go into Ayin Hara mm -hmm. a fantastic yes. chapter yes you know some of my uh, research uh, into these topics was uh, the conclusions were very surprising even for me <laughs> in other words in other words, the uh, the way that the rationalist mystical breakdown occurred was not always as expected and, and Ayin Hara was a kind of example of that, that people think that the, um, the, the, the widespread traditional understanding of Ayn Hara was that it means that when you look at something, you cause harm to it. When you look at something with negative intentions, you cause harm to it. And that was not the mystical approach. <laughs> that was the rationalist approach uh, because of a, of a historic understanding of how vision works. Was, how does vision work? How do we see things? So historically, there was a dispute. 
the uh, the majority position was that the way vision works is that things come out of our eyes, like with a flashlight, right? When you go in the dark with a flashlight, a light comes out of the flashlight. You know, it illuminates the area around you, right? A, you, a candle, right? The light comes out of the candle and makes it possible to see what's around. So people are just envisioning kind of the same way that something comes out of your eyes, right? I guess, um, you know, maybe similar to how bats use sonar, right? So vision is the same way. Uh, and if you have negative thoughts, the negative energy could come out of your eyes. That was, the, that was the scientific position. Now, Rambam, who disagreed with that idea of Ayn Hara, uh, Rambam, who saw Ayn Hara as being just a jealousy, right? That wasn't because he was more scientific than everyone else. It's just because he had a different understanding of the science. Mm -hmm. He happened to follow this minority view that vision is something absorbed by the eye, and therefore Ayn Hara can't possibly be a you know a scientific process of things coming out of the eye. So he would to be jealousy. But the ones who saw it as vision things coming out of the eye, they, they were not not being rationalist. They just had a different understanding of the science. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And when we get into today, uh, in the past few hundred years, when I say today, how did Ayn Hara, how is Ayn Hara viewed today? Right. So it's interesting to see how it developed. You know, he had a reverse of Cairo, who was still going with the idea that it's negative energy coming out of the eye. And he discussed about whether wearing, wearing glasses, wearing glasses may prevent Ayn Hara because the glass blocks it, uh, which is something very shocking for people to hear about today. <laughs> But uh, that was all based on the view that Ayn Hara is actually, you know, it's a physical phenomenon that can be blocked with glasses. You talk about whether windows also can block Ayn Hara. Uh, but, uh, but see, nowadays people are would be uncomfortable even, you know, to hear that this is how the great rabbinic authorities viewed the topic. So nowadays people all, all you know, go with Ayn Hara as being some kind of um, uh, jealousy, um, yeah, jealousy kind of thing. But in the idea that, um, again, but in a different way than Rambam. For Rambam um, is that a physical I, consequence of jealousy? Is that what you yeah, think? Yeah, so in other words, for Rambam, the idea of stopping Ayn Hara was don't flaunt things for people to be jealous of you um, because that would be bad for social relationships. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, but the, I would say most people today would, would prefer to have the idea that, you know, if you are... Uh, if you speak positively about something of your own, you know, that could cause negative, uh, you know, metaphysical negative effects to result. I think one of the things that, you know, has gone really haywire today is that people are using these sigulot and, you know, magical amulets and yeah. so on and so forth to kind of deflect right. Hara or avoid it. And that in itself has just taken on a life of its own. Absolutely. That has become like an yep. industry in itself. Right. And I think and it, course, it, it harms, it harms, you know, Judaism. People, people will see like outsiders will look at us. They won't see us as a wise and understanding people. They look us look at us as arcane and superstitious. Um, and I think that, you know, it doesn't do justice to the wisdom yeah. of, of Torah. I think that like the Rambam's approach to things is that why we call ourselves quote unquote Rambamists, it's not it's not an accurate term, but it's really he symbolizes, you know how we should think is that we should learn wisdom from everything, not just from, from the Torah, but, and it's okay to say that the rabbis got things wrong, as long as it's not in the realm of halakha. Halakha is halakha. And that's where the rabbis, you know, they have, they, they have jurisdiction, but when it comes to just any ideas about the world, it's fair game. Right. I do want to stress though, in my, in my book, about work in general, I am not out to delegitimize mysticism. That is not my mission uh, uh, for two reasons. Number one, I think that rationalism is not a, a perfect system and not a fully worked out system, still has many unanswered questions. Uh, but the main reason is that there's a reason why mysticism is more popular than rationalism, which is that for many people, mysticism provides for a much more passionate, uh, engaging form of Judaism and one that's psychologically tremendously beneficial. So it's really a case of different strokes, strokes for different folks. Right. Some people are more suited to the mystical approach, some people are more suited to the rationalist approach. Where I see my mission as being restoring and retaining and developing the rationalist approach uh, for those who are more attuned to it, as opposed to the yeshiva circles I went through where people didn't even imagine that such a thing ever existed. Right. I think it's also the fact that 
myst more mystical um, styles of, of Judaism, modes of Judaism, there it tends to be like a cookie cutter kind of thing where there's an answer for everything, even if the answer is unsatisfactory to most. But there is there is a feeling that oh everything has an answer, um, whereas you know there it's a, I, I think it's a more humbling to sometimes admit that we don't know. Just like even the greatest prophet Moshe Rabbeinu, right. you know he couldn't see God's face. There's limitations to human understanding. Right. So I find myself often pulled and pushed with regard to whether how strongly to be uh, to oppose mysticism, and that certainly you know difficult times, and you know and these are extremely difficult times we're in right now. You know, mysticism, mystical approaches are, are again tremendously helpful for people. On the other hand, they also allow the you know everything has its pros and cons. The rationalist approach has also has its own drawbacks. And it, it can lead people away from Judaism. But the mystical approach's uh, particular drawback is that it very much enables people to take be taken advantage of yeah. by uh, unscrupulous operators. Yeah. And uh, I see a lot of that. And it's very distressing. Yeah, um, exactly. It's, 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 it's hard to see people being taken advantage of and to be silent about it. Yeah. Um, the, the happy medium, I think, or the best way is to, is to at least... Uh, try to try to just I, I think that we that it's there is value in trying to have people just just preaching to them to be able to you know think think on their own you know not to just you know not be a like a yes to everything just to to practice critical thinking and if something is too good to be true sometimes there's right. a reason for it. <laughs> you know and I think that's an important uh, thing that you know for the mystical camp, I don't try personally to get into like, you know, the the nitty gritty or technicalities and, you know, even, you know, okay, you know, Kabbalah is non Kabbalah. But I do think that it's important and he mentioned it and you mentioned it that, you know, people get taken advantage of and we have to we have to right. just a little bit push people to think and be standing right. on their own two feet. I think that's right. And there's other cases where I would say it's not even necessarily people being taken advantage of, but people is making a basic mistake. In other words, one topic I came on to through all this, which I discussed in the last chapter, is uh, is the idea of can you do mitzvot and then nominate the reward for those mitzvot to go to other people? Oh, like, for example, if someone's passed away, you know, can you say, okay, I'm going to do a mitzvah and the reward will be for the uh, neshama of that lili nishmat, right, for the benefit of that person who's passed away or, or for someone who's alive, right? Can you say, I'm going to do a mitzvah and the reward from my mitzvah will go to that person. So this is something that's considered completely normative in Judaism today, right? Completely, completely normative. And yet, when I started looking into it, uh, it was amazing. <laughs> you see that classically, and this is a case where, you know, there's aspects of mysticism that go back a very long way. I right? know it's, you can't talk about Chazal being, were Chazal rationalist or mystic? Chazal is not a person. Chazal was a lot of people over a long period and in different places. And some of Chazal were more rationalistically inclined, some were more mystically inclined. Uh, but this, this is something where if you look in the Gemara, you know, th th there's no basis for it, right? There's no basis. There's an idea that anything you do is a credit to your parents, Right? There's a Gemara discussing how somebody who, who understands that his parents are suffering in the afterlife, and he goes to one of Chazal and says, what can I do? And, he, and he's told that he has to you know, say Kaddish and so on. But the point is, it's, it's things that only he can do, right? because he is their descendant. So depending on how their descendant turns out, you know, it can be a, a credit to them or, or otherwise. But you never see in classical Judaism the idea that you can do a mitzvah and then just nominate somebody else to receive the reward for that. And the first time that was discussed, um, one of the late Achronim, sorry, in the early Achronim, he says, uh, of course not. He says, there's just no mechanism, right? Everyone gets, we believe, in reward and punishment. People get reward and punishment according to their deeds. You can't just suddenly decide um, that, you know, pay some money or whatever, and, and you know, you're going to nominate uh, the reward for your mitzvah to go to someone else, right? Uh, and, and yet this is something that's become very widespread, and I think there's two reasons why. Number one is there's a lot of money to be made from it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. There is no, why did I first get suspicious of this whole topic? Because uh, unfortunately, I, uh, somebody passed away in my family, and uh, I wasn't sitting shiver. Somebody else in my family was sitting shiver, and I looked at they were given this book all about you know what can you do to help the person who's 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 passed away. And the first thing it said it said the best thing you can do is learn Torah, and, and there's a chus. 
And if you don't know how to learn Torah to a high level, you can pay someone else to do it. And it said, the second best thing you can do is give tzedakah. And what's the best tzedakah you can do? Pay someone to learn Torah. And I started getting, you know, suspicious. You know, my spidey sense started tingling. And uh, I looked at who published the Sefer. And lo and behold, it was published by a kolel that specializes in taking donations to uh, learn in memory of loved ones. And that's what you know, started my deep dive in this whole thing, where I saw that there's traditionally no basis for it. Uh, but what's the temptation? You know, you can make money, right? Uh, no one's paying you to learn Torah, but you can get payment and say that, oh, you're learning Torah to benefit some other people. And all of a sudden, there's money to be made. And I, I think the other reason is the person giving the money, they want to feel that they're doing something. Right? You lost a loved one. You want to do something for them. Um, Becoming, a, you know, working on yourself to become a, a shining, you know, testimony and, and credit to them is uh, not as easy as uh, as paying as as paying a, writing a check. So you write a check to uh, to some yeshiva or whatever and say, yes, it's you know, the money is uh, this the reward for that person's mitzvah uh, will benefit that person. So you get to feel good about yourself. So it's an easy way to feel that you're helping someone spiritually. And I think that's the other temptation for it. Even though, again, I must stress, there is no basis in classical Judaism for this. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think I see the same thing today with the war. You know, there's a terrible situation going on in Israel. And, uh, and there's, we have, you know, uh, we have 500,000 people in uniform right now uh, doing real Masir Nefesh, right? Real, genuine Masir Nefesh. And there's other people uh, working hard at a lower level, but working to help them in various ways, you know, supplies, helping families and so on. Uh, in fact, right now, as I speak, you know, I'm speaking in my office at the museum. So in the museum, we have uh, 80 evacuees from Steyrot right now. who uh, We have someone who sponsored them getting a tour of the museum, uh, getting a break and, uh, you know, giving some uh, a bit of a respite from what, they, what they've been going through. Uh, but there's other people who think, OK, I want to help. What can I do? So, you know, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to learn Torah in the Zechus of the soldiers, or I'm going to pay someone else to learn Torah in the Zechus of the soldiers. And it's very nice to be thinking about the soldiers, but these are not things that are going to help. Right. Yeah, that's a tough one for people to yeah to handle. Right. Um, and we're, we're we're probably going to address it at some point with with a, another guest. But I actually wanted to um, discuss even mysticism and and as a whole because I think these phrases that we use. It's just for, you know, the limitation of language and the fact that we have to just kind of summarize things with words that we say rationalism, which is not entirely, it's not an accurate uh, description of of a rabbinic worldview, even the Rambam, because the Rambam himself was a mystic, right? And, uh, and depends how you look at it. Depends, 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 depends how you your definitions. Yes. We've had episodes. He believed in the, uh, the active intellect and so on. But, right, uh, right, right. But people will consider, you know, the Rambam as many in his in that camp will say, well, he was a mystic. And I think the problem with the mysticism camp is really that anything kind of goes like we, we want to kind of we have to be careful in, in terms of um, understanding what is mysticism, because there is definitely true a true strand of mysticism that's always been there, like you mentioned. But then there's a lot of stuff that just attached itself over time and right. kind of, kind of manipulation that, of yeah. concepts. Right, it's a, it's a catch-all word for uh, catch lots word. of exactly. things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, anyway, you wanted to. Uh, our listeners have always asked us to talk about demons. It's a it's a topic which I think people don't have um, a lot of knowledge about. I mean, it's just there's not a lot of People want to learn about, you know, the the Jewish approach to demons, and you see it in Tanakh, you see it in the Gemara, you see it in the Rishon. Yeah. So, can you talk to us about demons? Yeah. About so naturally, this was another topic that was right up my street, which I did a lot of research again. And again, I was very surprised at a lot of these topics. So, there's so much scholarship out there. There's so many spies that have been written, so much academic Jewish research, and it's amazing that there's still basic topics. That have never been researched. It's just amazing, astonishing to me. So it has Shemli Reyav, Ayn Hara, all these things nobody had ever done serious, serious research. And I don't mean polemical research. In other words, you have people who will find authorities that support their idea of how this topic should be understood. But I'm talking about research where you see the history, you know, the intellectual history of a topic and uh, how different sources understood it. Uh, so Demons was another one that I just couldn't believe it had never been done. Uh, so I did it, and again, and the things I found were surprising. Firstly, I think it's fairly well known, uh, Rambam did deny the existence of demons. 
Right? Rambam did not believe in demons. Not everyone could come to terms with that, right? Because again, for many people, if you're embedded in a certain worldview, a religious worldview, then it's often very important for a person to believe that every single great rabbinic figure in the past also shared the same worldview. And that's something that you'll see both some mystics do and some hyper-rationalists do also. Right? You've got the mystics who will believe say that every great Jew in the past was always a mystic and they'll do total revisionism on Rambam. And then you've got some hyper-rationalists who will say, you know, every great Jewish rabbinic figure in the past was a, was a rationalist and they'll do revisionism on the non-rationalist rabbinic authorities. Uh, so there were those who, you know, refused to acknowledge that Rambam did not believe in demons, but clearly he didn't. But again, like with Ayn Hara, those who did believe in demons, which was certainly the majority of rabbinic authorities, it wasn't necessarily because they weren't rationalist. It was because for most of history, demons were a perfectly reasonable thing to believe in. Because there's a lot of unexplained phenomenon in the world. And if you don't have the benefit of all the centuries of scientific discovery to explain why various uh, phenomena happen, what's wrong with it? makes perfect sense to believe in demons. <laughs> you know, why not? There's all kinds of weird forces in the world. You know, there's magnetism. How do you explain magnetism? You know, for Rashba, Rashba, he goes into the discussion of magnetism, and he says, you know, there's people who are you know, rationalists, and they deny, you know, this supernatural kind of phenomenon, but look at, look at magnetism, he says. Mm -hmm. All right, so nowadays, we have an understanding of magnetism as being, you know, a scientific, uh, you know, a naturalistic force. It's hard to, you know, we can't see it, we can't feel it, but we understand it in scientific terms. And we see magnetism as something completely different from demons. Uh, but, you know, but centuries ago, that difference was not, was not clear, was not apparent. You know, there's certain, we see phenomena that, that occur which are not physical. So why is it any more unreasonable to believe that when, you know, when strange things happen in the world, which they do, that it's, that it's demons causing it? So again, it is a case where you can't break down uh, those who do believe in demons and those who don't as being mystics versus rationalists. Nowadays, you could perhaps. Right? People who still believe in demons, you, can, you could say that they are mystics rather than rationalists. Uh, but you can't categorize the historic rabbinic authorities that way. And, and this is a theme throughout the book, is that, and, and I, I, try, I kind of pointed it before, that you see that, you know, when it comes to the Rishonim, right, like they were almost all rational leaning in the way they went about how, how they went about things. Right. right. Even they believed so in there were differences, right? Obviously, those in Sfar oh, were much yeah. more not scientifically knowledgeable than those in Ashkenaz. Plus, those in Ashkenaz tended to be literalists. That you know, all the agaritas, all the strange things in the Gemara, there was an approach in in, in Ashkenaz just to understand all those things literally. Whereas in in uh, Sfar, they were much more open to non-literal uh, interpretations. Yes, but scientifically, they kind of all had a scientific. Like the Rambam, kind of more, more, to... always, yeah, they tended to be more. Everyone, all of us, shown them tended to be more open yeah. to things that Rambam. were shown, shown through to them. Yeah, like with with the Ramban. The Ramban was a complicated uh, figure because he was a mystic, but he was based in Sfarad, so that gave him a more rationalistic bent. Yeah, but like what? for for example, the science of necromancy, right? It was a still he still categorized it as a science because to right. him that's what right. he observed. It was, he he it thought was a he science, observed yeah. something. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So so it's a, it's very interesting. So um okay, great. Um there's two other topics, they're fundamental, the nature of Torah and the function of mitzvot. Yeah. Um as it, you would think that, you know, oh, the nature of Torah, the function of mitzvot, it should be such a given, right? Yeah. Basically like, you know, you know what we spend all our day doing, um but as your chapters show, um very different today than how it was and if you can break that down yeah and again these are things which is so shocking and eye-opening for me you know certain things that i always understood from all my years in yeshiva and growing up as a from jew certain things that i just thought were a total given and normative and judaism cannot be any other way and then you look at how many things are just not actually traditionally based and, and see how they evolved um let's start with with, with mitzvot, mitzvot. Like what, what do mitzvot do? What's the purpose of mitzvot in general? So Rambam says explicitly that all mitzvot uh, serve one or more of three possible functions. They, they teach you ideas about Judaism, about Torah. They improve your character or they improve society. That is what all mitzvot do. With some, it's easier to understand how they do that, the, the mishpatim. With others, the chukim, it's harder to understand how they do that. But that is what mitzvot do. 
Whereas according to the mystical approach, yes, mitzvot do all those things, but that's a relatively minor aspect of what mitzvot do. The primary function of what mitzvot do is to manipulate various supernatural forces. All right. So uh, in, in the book, I show various different you know, ways and that plays out. You know, what is mezuzah? The rationalist view is that mezuzah is a reminder, a reminder of what's important in life, whereas the mystical view is that mezuzah is supernatural protection for the house. Uh, washing the hands in the morning, what's that about? So according to the earliest we've shown them who discuss it, the mitzvah of washing your hands is uh, psychological, to put yourself in the frame of mind of being the Kohen, starting his service in the beta, in the of Mikdash, and also physical hygiene. Whereas according to the mystical view, it's removing ayin hara, right? removing um, supernaturally harmful forces. And we see that with many mitzvahs, that's how it plays out, that you see different understandings of this mitzvah going back many, many, many centuries. And again, my goal is not to argue that one of you is right or one of you is wrong, but just to show that there's different understandings uh, of what mitzvahs are all about. Now, then when it comes to Torah, the mitzvah learning Torah, there you see that the biggest and most fundamental and, and difference of all, with enormous ramifications, especially today. Now, what is the mitzvah of learning Torah all about? So again, according to the rationalist approach, and in this case, it's also the classical approach, learning Torah, you know, you're getting an understanding of Judaism. And you're learning about how to become a better person, how to build a better society. Right? You look at the Chumash, the Gemara, what's it all about? Building a just society. Um, comes along the mystical approach, and it says, yes, Torah does all that. But that's a relatively minor aspect of what learning Torah is. The, the, the major aspect of learning Torah is mystical, is creating positive spiritual energy in the world. And the one who was responsible for making that really penetrate in, in Litvish circles uh, was Rav Chaim Volozhin. Rav Chaim Volozhin, who totally, in his, in his effort to combat Hasidim, who were negating the importance of learning Torah, so he decided to play up Torah, the mystical side of it. He redefined learning Torah Lishma as being learning Torah for its own sake, for the positive spiritual energies that result from it which is not what Torah Lishma historically meant. Historically, Torah Lishma was like everything, like everything that means Lishma as opposed to Shalom Lishma. Shalom Lishma is doing something for nefarious purposes, right? and Lishma is doing something for the uh, correct purposes. But uh, Chaim Vloshin, he innovated this idea that Torah Lishma is learning Torah for its own sake, just for the sake of learning Torah and all the spiritual energies uh, that result from that. And then the midst of learning Torah which was always a foundational importance in Judaism, but the reason why it was foundationally important was because you've got to know what to do in order to know how to do it, in order to know what to do. Right? In other words, where the, uh, the Chazal discussed, which is greater, or uh, learning or doing. And what the answer was, so the result of the debate was learning is greater because learning leads to doing. In other words, the goal is to do, but if you don't learn, you're not going to know or be motivated to do. The learning takes precedence. Talmud Torah Keneged Kulam, right, which is a phrase I heard endlessly in Yeshiva about how learning Torah is more important than everything else put together. But what nobody realizes is that that b'risa of Talmud Torah Keneged Kulam, it's part of a larger b'risa. And in the larger b'risa, you know, after listing all these mitzvot and saying Talmud Torah Keneged Kulam, it then goes to a list of averus, of sins, and it says Lashon Hara Keneged Kulam. <laughs> now, no one's going to say that Lashon Hara is worse than murder. <laughs> right? You know, rhetorically, you know, I, I speak that way. But no one's going to say Lashon Hara is worse than murder, than, than, than Avodah Zara, than Gilead Arais. So what does that price mean? It means there's certain foundational aspects in these mitzvot and the virus. And as Rambam says, clearly, the foundational aspect in Talmud Torah is that it teaches you what to do. But the focus is on always, on, you know, on living Torah, what you're going to be doing, not on the learning. Chaim Velozhin switched the focus back to the learning. And then, you know, phrases like Tamil Torah and Egad Kula were divorced of their original meaning. And you have this idea today, and how did that evolve today, that learning Torah has been, in, uh, in Litvish circles, certainly, has been boosted beyond what it ever was in history. Right? And, this, uh, and, and this idea that, that uh, and certainly the opposition to, to uh, being paid for Torah, which Rambam himself was very extreme in that aspect. He didn't even want people to be paid for teaching Torah. The normative approach of a history was certainly that being paid for teaching Torah is fine, uh, but learning Torah not. But that's completely disappeared now. Right? People now have no shame in being paid for learning Torah for their whole lives. Right? Not, I'm not talking about people who are learning to become rabbis, to become teachers, mm. to become dionim. 
We're talking about somebody who's sitting in Koil, you know, plans to sit there for the rest of his life and thinks says it's perfectly all right to be be paid. Why? Because he is mystically bringing positive energy into the world. He is contributing to society, contributing to the world. And these are, you know, these are mystical ideas. And do you find that there is, like, now you're experiencing a, you know, terrible war that's going on now, and I'm seeing a little, like, maybe they're just grassroots kind of things that are going on, but I'm starting to see slightly that the Haredi world is kind of shifting their view. But yeah, do you find very, any hope no. in that? Very, very little. People talk about you know, 3,000 Haredim signed on to join the army. Uh, in the end, it was 700. And the, I've got friends who are, who are part of that. And they uh, they would be the first to say that they're not really part of the Haredi world. You know, these are the people who are you know already past yeshiva, already doing other things with their life. Uh, there has not it, been it, much it, of a change. What, what I do see interesting, though, is, uh, again, it's, it's, look, this is, again, I said, a very, very painful topic painful topic for people in my community where, you know, in my shul alone, there's 80 uh, young men and women who are in the army, right? 80 just from my shul. And, uh, you know, and the amount of uh, funerals, it's just, it's just appalling and, and, and horrific. And you have this whole entire community, which is saying, no, we're exempt from that. No, that's not going to be us. So, you know, I understand, you know, the opposition to go into the army is that going to the army is a, a, a tremendous threat to their lifestyle. They don't feel a tremendous sense of civic responsibility because they're not a Zionist. Um, but at the same time, I think now there's a certain understanding of, uh, of guilt. So how do you get around that guilt? Nobody wants to feel that they're doing something wrong. So I think the mysticism has played in now, and that's why you see a lot more of this idea of Torah protecting. And yes, willing Torah, and that's going to protect the nation. Which, again, is something with no, you look at the historical basis for it, and it, it, it's so it's just so not there. In other words, historically, you will find some sources in Chazal about Torah protecting, but never that that is a substitute for actual action. You know, it says that Torah protects from illness, too. You don't see Haredi Town saying, we don't need hospitals, we don't need Kupat Cholim. Um, right? It was never a replacement for the actual doing what you have to do. And why is that now becoming so popular? Because people feel uh, guilty. I would say, I think that's the reason. They want to rationalize to others outside of their community. They want to rationalize to themselves. How is it that we're not involved in this effort? So they'll come up with this mystical idea that, yes, learning Torah is what's really providing the protection. Um, I want to just go back to something you said when we discussed the nature of Torah and the function of mitzvot. Um, you were mentioning how uh, the mystical approach, uh, when it when it wants to explain the purpose of Torah, purpose of mitzvot, it agrees with the rational understanding, but that the rational understanding is a minor. Yeah. Uh, those are the words, right? The, a minor point, but right. the, the larger point, right, is the metaphysical contribution yeah. or, mm -hmm. or, okay. Um, that, to me, I remember um, about, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 years ago, this point was actually the hardest point for me to adjust with for my own personal journey. Why? Mm -hmm. Because when you are used to thinking that you're learning Torah or you're performing mitzvot is making cosmic changes. Yeah. When you're used to understanding that, mm -hmm. like, you know, there are things you know, great things happening beyond what you can even imagine and, you know, the whole world. Right. It is very difficult mm -hmm. to go from that to my mitzvah now is good for society and it's giving me a good opinion. And, I, and, I'm, right. and I'm just... I'm, absolutely, absolutely. You expressed it very well. That is a seductive appeal of mysticism. Yeah, uh, and it's tremendously to. empowering. Uh, and that's why it's... Ultimately, I recognize that rationalism is not for everyone, and mysticism is, is much more, much more powerful and much more motivating for people because you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're believing that everything you do is invested with this tremendous cosmic significance. It it's literally took appealing. me like it literally took me like a year or two till I was able to to embrace it. Right, mm -hmm. in the way it properly should be embraced. It's not an sure. easy idea to come and down. That's why Hashgacha Pratis, right? That's why you look at the Rishonim and their views of Hashgacha Pratis. It was very, very limited. So why did it change to now that everyone thinks that the slightest thing that happens is Ashgach yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's much easier to live life that way, right? I missed the bus not because I was late or because, you know, there was a problem with the bus schedule, but because, you know, Hashem wanted me to miss the bus for grand cosmic reasons. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And then I, I think that one of the issues with that also is that 
it takes away personal responsibility. Yes. Things like Ayn Haran, all these things are the, the, the problem with it is that you no longer look inward and you start thinking that everything right. that's going on, all the problems in the world Excellent. are due to external factors and everything that's going right in the world is due to my, it's such an ego trip. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It is, there is aspects of that for sure. And yet at the same time, when people are suffering and going through hardship, it's this a is an approach which helps them. So, so I wrestle with this. So to, to how much do we want to uh, point out that it's not necessarily authentic Judaism? I don't know. It's very, very, very hard. It's interesting because the, Ram, the Rambam also mentions that if someone wants to use an app, he's against amulets, but if someone's right. dying and they request an amulet, yes. you just let him have, like, this is his like, right. final final day and let him have yeah. it. It'll comfort him going into the, you know, right. the afterlife. Right. But we were, t- we just had a recently an episode on um, the let the letters between Shadal, Shadal and Rav Benamozeg. And mm-hmm. something interesting that came up was that when Shadal's mother was, was uh, very, oh, yeah. yeah, she was dying. His, he was only 13 years old or so, right? Yeah, he was his, young. His, fa- his father told him to say these magical, his father's into mysticism, mm-hmm. say this magical formula. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I don't believe in this. I'm not going to say it. I think it's mm-hmm. nonsensical. And right. as he matured and as he grew up, he said, I probably should have done it, you know, right. just to satisfy him. But right. Um, right. it's just an interesting, mm-hmm. you know. The, 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 this, this uh, yeah, like it's we're, to re- the wrestling with, what should we do with these things? Yes. It's, it's right. Like, That's you know, very challenging. Saying, it's very challenging. There's no clear yeah, right or wrong answers. About it. There's no clear right or wrong answers, and everything has its benefits and its drawbacks. Look, apparently with Shlomo Zaman Orbach, you know, he was endorsed people going to, um, to uh, what's it called, to Amukha, to Davin for a Shidduch, even though he knew that it was baseless, and Rav Yonatan Benazil isn't even there there. But he felt it's, you know, people psychologically uh, helped by it. So endorse, so we, you know, we can go along with it. So, yeah, maybe yes. Maybe some people are taken advantage of or, or, you know, they think that that replaces, that that's why, you know, people are, you know, people singles, people looking to get married are often tortured with the idea that they have to do this gula, they don't the right segulas. Maybe that's why they're not married, they haven't done the right segulas. And I'm not sure if it's necessarily so psychologically helpful uh, to, to play along with that. I don't know. These are very tough calls to make. Yeah, they're tough calls to make, and um, we appreciate so much uh, that you came on and tackled these topics with us. Um, we really um, also wanted to recommend people uh, your website, um, rationalistjudaism.com, because you get into a lot of these and the book Rationalism versus Mysticism, which we have over here. Um, I think the rationalistjudaism.com, you tackle a lot of like, indi- like for example, just things like. Uh, a shlusel chala, right? And yeah. the kind of things that um, we're kind of discussing this right now, where we have to also set limitations and boundaries because certain things just, you know, they they take on a life of its own, and we have to figure out as as a community where do we draw the line? Where, you know, what is what is now, what is Judaism, and what is now something else? So right. I think your website actually for me is has been a great resource because you you bring to light a lot of issues that are like today's issue yeah, you know current, that are current event thank you thank you and, i also uh, just want to mention that if people do want to buy the book the best way for them to do so is from the museum website okay you get to the museum website you can just uh you do a search online for the biblical museum of natural history uh, the website is biblical natural and uh in the store there that's where you can buy my books and it's uh free shipping in the u.s and and could you also tell people briefly like what it is about your uh museum that they can actually enjoy and see that. Right. How is your so the museum, museum doesn't get into any controversial topics. Uh, we have a very strict policy at the museum, in fact, of not getting into any controversial topics because we want the museum to be, uh, you know, amenable to all sectors of the population. And we do. We get everyone. We get Dati, secular, Haredi, Hasidic, everybody. And it's learning about the animal world of the Torah, the, the identity of the animals of the Torah, the symbolism, what they represent, uh, the role they play in historic in, in Judaism and Jewish identity. We have halls dedicated to Halacha, the Hall of Kashrus, Hall of Shofars. Um, and we have a lot of, you know, hall dedicated to appreciating the wonders of creation. Uh, and the experience itself is, is guided, very interactive. Uh, like I said, a lot, a lot of live exotic animals, too, that you get to meet, to handle. So it's uh, educational and also a lot of fun. 
In your book, you had a book on like mythical creatures. Uh, sacred yeah. monsters, yeah. Sacred it's also monsters. on the museum website. So sacred monsters is about um, uh, mythical creatures in, uh, in in the Gemara and Midrash and how to understand them. Unicorns, dragons, phoenixes, mermaids, spontaneous generation, right? salamanders coming from fire, all the Harry Potter creatures. You know, these are all things that have been part of mythology for a long time. And a lot of them appear in, in various Jewish sources. So that book goes through different approaches of how to understand them. And um, last word on the book of the topic today, Rationalism versus Mysticism. Um, I just wanted the viewers to know um, this book is different than any other rational versus mystical book for the very reason that this is not talking from an ideological perspective. It's not coming at a ideological uh, rationalism versus mysticism. But what Rabbi Slifkin has done here is essentially just in a, it's, it's a development of these topics and ideas from the Gemara to the Rishonim to the Chronim. And so the reader himself is able to see the development of these ideas across a thousand years, if not more, and to be able to see how these ideas have developed in Judaism. And the ideas speak for themselves from within the sources. And I think that that's an incredible achievement because I have never seen a book like this before. So I highly recommend it. And, uh, we thank you, Rabbi Slifkin, for your contributions. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being on the show. Thank you. All right. Shavuot Tov. And be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.